joystick issues, they seem to be a hot topic lately, specifically joystick drift, which the Joy-Con is known very well for. But we also see the drift topic coming up in some capacity for many modern controllers. Thinking back to the days of the PS3, I don't remember anyone talking about controller drift. Are new controllers more susceptible to drift than they were in the past, or are we just talking about it more these days? Are new controllers going cheap with inferior parts, or do we just handle them too rough? Fun questions to think about, but I won't be answering any of them. If you want to dive deeper on these broad questions, I'll link a useful video from VK's channel down below. I'm going to focus on a specific repair, and hopefully it adds some insight to the larger topic. I want to give some credit to VK's channel. We've had several conversations recently about joystick drift over the generations. These talks inspired me to get my hands on a drifting PS5 controller to try and fix it. Big thanks to VK for the perspective and insights. Let's get started. I bought this PS5 controller from eBay specifically because it was claimed to have drift. First thing to do is test this out and see if it has drift. Windows has a tool that lets you do a basic check on a USB controller. We can see in the XY axis box that the crosshair is not really in the center. It sort of has a bias to the right and a little bit down. Of course that corresponds with the left joystick. It seems to operate fairly normally, however it has trouble returning back to the center axis. And you might also be seeing there's a little bit of flickering in the crosshair sometimes as well. So the left joystick, it's not working optimally. There is a little bit of drift that we can observe on this tool. It's not that bad though, so the next thing I want to try is check, does this translate to an issue when we're playing a real game? For in-game test, we're using Rogue Company because in the settings we have left stick and right stick dead zone. I've set both to 0.05. That's what I've found is kind of the threshold for a controller that I know is working well that I've labeled with G for good. That's the threshold where this controller doesn't start to drift on its own. So you can see when I'm not touching the left joystick, she's not moving. And when I do, she does. That's how we would expect things to work, right? This controller we have labeled B for bad, and my left thumb is actually holding her straight. If I let go, drifting. So I think that's pretty definitive, albeit slight, that this controller has left stick drift. Now let's go through how we're going to fix it. First thing is this black faceplate is going to come off. Get a spudger, kind of jimmy it under there. Try and get under this one from this direction. There we go. That's actually a better approach. I'd recommend that for both. Next thing is to take out these shoulder buttons. And that reveals a screw here and on the other side. And there's two under that black plastic piece we took off a second ago. We'll undo those. Those triggers are kind of captive there. Push those as we get this through, that helps. I just had a battery fall out of me, so flip it over and then take that one off. Next is this microphone. And remove this screw. I'm just pushing down, the joysticks kind of pop it out. There's some clips around the edges. So that board's ready to come out. Unless I want to remove all these black pieces on the sides, I can simply desolder these wires, which is what I'm going to do. With that done, this board should just come out. Well, I can't really see or do much from out here, so I have to take this thing off. With the exception of these two pads, all these solder joints around here need to be undone for us to get that joystick out. There's a few different methods to do this. The best is a hot air reflow station if you have one of those. I don't, so I'm just going to use a solder sucker to clear those out and hopefully pop it out. Well, you just bore witness to the desperation I had to go through to get this to work. I just could not get it to happen with this solder sucker tool. So what I was just doing, first off, is the small rubber ring for the corner here. I removed that, and then I used my heat gun, and I just went around this whole thing while I had my helping hands clipping the end of the joystick, just using it as a weight, so that when they reflowed enough, the weight of that would pull this out. I'm not proud of it, but that's kind of what you do when you don't have a proper reflow station. Let's keep going. Surface level, this thing doesn't look too bad. I'm interested to get into the potentiometers, so let's take a look. Oopsie daisies. No worries. There she is. 
This is a familiar sight for a lot of modern joysticks. There's a tip here and on the opposite side, and that contacts with this inner carbon pad. Up here, if you can see the light reflecting, there's an additional contact point that reaches this upper track. When this thing rotates and wipes, that's what's altering the resistance. It's a voltage divider, and it gives an input back to the controller as to the position of where your stick is based on the voltage readout from it. I don't see anything obviously wrong. I mean, those tracks look to be in pretty good condition. On the inner ring, you can see a little bit of light reflection that kind of looks like a bump. I'm not sure if that's anything to be concerned about, but we'll make note of it. On this piece, it appears to be in good shape. Let's open the other side and see if we have a different situation. Try and not tiddlywink it across the room this time. What do we have here? Oh, that can't be good. Uh, we'll come to that in a second. First, I want to look at the carbon track. Kind of see a little change in the light reflection as before, but not as much as on the other side. Again, it looks pretty good. So let's take a look what happened with this thing. What is that? Okay, I think I see what's going on. This is a little retainer clip, and there's one right here, but there's not one right here, because it's right here. I don't think that's good. From the side, hopefully you can see that clip is sticking out. It's latching onto the green piece here. Now, this one is not clipping onto anything because it's not on there. Does that matter, though? It's not like this thing is pushing out, you know what I mean? I don't know if that's a problem. So that means I'm kind of stumped here. Maybe something other than the potentiometers is an issue. Let's get in deeper and see if we can find out. Corner clips can be bent out of the way. All the internals look well intact and clean, so we'll just reassemble it and focus our attention back to the potentiometers. I'm actually going to solder this right back to the board because the potentiometers can go on after. Here's what things look like so far, minus the potentiometers. We'll get to those now. We saw a suspicious bump on the inner track of the pot for the up-down direction. It doesn't seem ideal, but looks attributable to normal manufacturing variation, as evidenced by us not seeing drift in the up-down directions earlier. So let's focus on the other one with this broken white clip. Something I was questioning was whether I broke this clip during disassembly. I'm showing some earlier footage right now, and you can see that that clip is already missing before I disassembled the potentiometer from the joystick. But I don't actually know where it is in this shot. It fell out when I removed the pot. So for all I know, it was actually sitting inside the raceway of these carbon tracks, which obviously would not be good. Another point is whether this is needed for function. I could try something crazy like gluing it back in, but with the confined space here, I think that's riskier than just leaving it out. Now, if the clip interfering in the carbon track area is the problem, we might already be good simply by removing it. As an extra layer of safety, I'm going to clean the carbon tracks with alcohol and bend the wiper contacts outward a little bit so that they pressurize harder against the carbon when reassembled. So I'll bend the top track here and the contacts on the side right here. Now, you don't want to go too crazy. This is what mine looks like now just a little bit bent up higher than before. Getting it back under the joystick. This one I cleaned out as well for good measure. And that's the end result. Let's put this all back together and see if what we did was good. I'm trying to get a comparison shot going here. On the left side we have before I did anything, and on the right is where we are now. So you can see it's a lot better returning to the center. It doesn't appear to be perfect, like maybe slightly to the right, but compared to where we were at before, over here, the difference to me is pretty drastic. It was also flickering a lot before. The little crosshair here would just start jumping around, and now it's not doing that. Let's try it on the game. Get the sticker back on so we don't mix these up. Okay, quick check like before. Looks good. She's not running to the right anymore. I think we did it, guys. Don't need that anymore. 
That's the one we need. Well, I'm pretty amped about this repair. Many of you may be aware that modern remotes all seem to use these potentiometer-based joysticks instead of Hall Effect or magnetic joysticks of the past seen on things like the Dreamcast and some PS3 controllers. Now, these older joysticks aren't immune to drift. Since they use magnets, their material properties can degrade over time, change with temperature, things like that. But since the moving parts don't contact each other, like in the case of the carbon tracks here, it is safe to say they should last a lot longer. And it begs the question, why are companies today using the potentiometers if the Hall Effect joysticks are better? Well, because it's cheaper. And that's not necessarily a bad thing if the products are priced accordingly and the market is informed about their usage life. Unfortunately, that hasn't exactly been how things have gone. And that's as deep as I'll go here on the broader topic. This repair focused on a specific case of drift on the DualSense 5, and it isn't a one-size-all fix. If anything, it just goes to show that drift can appear for many different reasons. In this case, it was a tiny broken retaining clip, either interfering with the wipers against the pads or negatively impacting the pressure of the wiper against the pads. My best guess as to what happened here is that someone dropped this controller and it landed in a weird way and caused that tiny piece of plastic to fracture on the inside. Now, should they be designed to withstand such an event? I'll let you answer that. The process here of removing the broken plastic and reshaping those wipers so they'd increase the contact pressure against the carbon pads, that solved the issue. Well, that's going to do it for this video. If you liked what you saw or have any questions, let me know down below. You might as well subscribe while you're at it. I think there's like a notification bell. Yep, you might as well turn that on too. As always, thanks for watching. Now I'm going to go play some PS5. Sweet, sweet, drift-free PS5. Thanks, guys.